Our next speaker, Lois Levine, lies for a living. But having earned degrees in history and literature from Harvard, USC, and UCLA, she likes to get the facts right. Her scholarly and creative work has appeared in numerous academic and literary journals, as well as the New York Times, The Atlantic, the Chicago Tribune, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Review of Books, NPR, and engraved on a hospital wall. <laughs> it's a medievalist wall. I want to see. Um, this is her first time at Kalamazoo. Uh, and she begs you to I'm come to session 360, Saturday at 10 a.m., where she will reprise the plenary talk that bowled him over at the Framing Premodern Desire Conference in Finland last month. <laughs> and right now, for us, she will present her paper, Affection Makes Him Her False, He She Speaks Not True, Embracing Fiction's Fakery. I offer my singular thanks to the collective for organizing this. So yes, I am a practiced hand at fakery. I'm a novelist, which is an occupation that involves faking other people's actions and emotions, carefully crafting fictional characters so they seem entirely plausible to my readers. My fakery involves a particularly acute blurring of fact and fiction, because I write historical novels, interweaving scholarly research and actual historical figures into invented narratives. I actually think of fiction writing as a way to share scholarship with the general public. And that's, I'm going to talk more about that at that session tomorrow. And I also promise to show you the most amusing Shakespeare-related film clip that you've ever seen. <laughs> so you should come. Um, and in fact, I'm such a faker that although I'm often described by myself, my agent, and my publisher as a PhD trained novelist, I actually have no graduate training in history. And in the course of acquiring two master's degrees and a PhD in English, I never took a single creative writing course. So I'm really faking it all across the board. <laughs> My first novel, The Secrets of Mary Bowser, uh, which was published by HarperCollins in 2012, is based on a footnote from my dissertation. So Mary Bowser was a real person. She was born into slavery in Richmond, Virginia, sent north and a freed and sent north to be educated. She then went back to the South and during the Civil War became a spy for the Union by posing as a slave in the Confederate White House. So this is a fascinating and inspiring story, and almost nothing about her life appears in the historical record. So I drew on what I knew about slavery and abolition from my academic training and crafted, uh, imagined what her life might have been like. Um, but my fakery has deepened of late. I have a new novel about to come out from Simon & Schuster called Juliet's Nurse. And it recounts the 14 years leading up to the events in Romeo and Juliet as told from the point of view of the nurse. Uh, only yesterday did I think, oh my god, they're all art historians and I'm showing the cover. <laughs> and we should talk about fakery in this cover, but it didn't come up in my talk. Um, ask me about it later. Uh, Juliet's nurse is set in Trecento Verona, which means I am now faking expertise in medieval Italy. My fakery in, according, in incorporating aspects of medieval history, from uh, images of breastfeeding and details of wet nurse contracts, to symptoms and effects of the plague, to Italian beekeeping practices is redoubled by the fact that I'm also playing with and plagiarizing Shakespeare, who is himself <laughs> one of the greatest fakers in all of historical literature. And only when I put the slide together did I realize he and I have the same author photo. <laughs> <laughs> so what lies at the root of this fakery? Well, pleasure, really. Um, I come to my fakery, as perhaps all of us do, as someone who loves reading both literature and history. As a novelist, my pleasure comes from the challenge of creating a story-driven work that incorporates historical facts. And this operates a couple of ways in Juliet's Nurse. I need to work around what's true about the historical period of 14th century Verona, but also about what we know or think we know from Shakespeare. Um, for example, in medieval Italy, there was a belief that having sex would taint a wet nurse's milk. And that makes perfect sense to people who know things about the theory of humors but will be weird and alien and not understandable to my readers. Um, in Shakespeare's play, the nurse describes her husband as a merry man, and she's clearly herself pretty ribald. So it's hard to imagine this couple abstaining from sex for the three years during which Juliet is being nursed. What do I do with that to make it all make sense to my readers? Well, let's just say I got to write a lot of very fun scenes, and scenes that I hope will be also fun for my readers. And that's really another part of the pleasure of this kind of fakery. Um, my readers are generally people who are never going to pick up an academic tome 
or even really any work of nonfiction, even a mainstream biography, they, they are just not interested in nonfiction. But they devour novels, and often particularly historical fiction, believing that they are driven by a love of learning about the past. So there's all this pleasure in, in what I do, but also, of course, some terror. Um, and I chose this slide, it, you know, this is Harvard's uh, crest, so talk about your medieval fakery, and I'd love to talk more about where I got the image. Um, we are all trained to seek veritas, right? And in our veritas-driven world as scholars, about the greatest transgression that you can commit is to make it all up. Indeed, anyone who's ever taken their master's or doctoral exam, stood up to teach a class, replied enthusiastically to the job search committee's questions, <laughs> or indeed presented at a session at an academic conference, all the while thinking, when are these people going to figure out I am a total fraud? <laughs> when are they going to realize I don't know anything, or at least I don't yet know everything? All of us who have shared that terror understand what it means to be tainted by even the merest whiff of intellectual fakery. Um, and I, of course, am terrified that somebody who studies 14th century Italy is going to point out some huge errors that I have made in my work. Um, and of course, while terror, panic, and self-deprecation don't serve any of us well, I actually want to assert that there is something academically useful in considering the extent to which we, as scholars, are all always faking it. That is, we're most intellectually honest when we admit up front just how unknowable the past is, right? You stand at the graveside begging your subject to tell you things. Because I'm sure you thought that that would happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not suggesting that we should make no attempt to get history right. But I think that we serve ourselves, our field, our students, and the public well when we talk explicitly about the challenges of getting it right. And this became clear to me during, I think, two particular moments in my life as a historical novelist. The first was at the Historical Novel Society, which is a meeting for both authors of and readers of historical fiction. Uh, this was a meeting in London in 2012. It's a very affirming meeting to go to because the Brits all speak with these very scholarly sounding accents, so you feel like you're totally legitimate. <laughs> and it was indeed in a very learned accent that the Oxford Classics professor and historical novelist Harry Sidebottom reminded the audience that Herodotus and Thucydides were actually writing historical fiction. And in a similarly impressive accent, Ian Mortimer, who is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a historical novelist, observed that you can find a fact documented in the British National Archives, then travel across the channel and find the very opposite fact documented in the French National <laughs> Archives. Um, all of which is to say, we must approach our sources and even our models remembering the very challenge of telling truth from fakery. The second one of these moments happened for me at the Museum of the Confederacy, where I appeared for a program that was about Mary Bowser, my slave turned spy. And the other speaker there, who's the, the woman on this side, was Liz Barron, who is a professor at the University of Virginia. She wrote a biography of Bette Van Loo, the white woman who had owned Mary Bowser, freed her, sent her to be educated, and then later actually was in the same spiring with her. And that biography was published by Oxford University Press. Um, so she's legit. <laughs> Liz began by talking about how historians use evidence and conjecture to craft narratives about the past. I then reflected on how I, as a historical novelist, use evidence and conjecture to craft narratives about the past. But I also confess to what Liz never would, that I knowingly deviated from what I knew to be true in crafting my fictionalized version of Mary Bowser's life. That is to say, story has to drive my work, and I have to remember that that's what my readers want. And I gave some examples to illustrate why, as a novel, I, novelist, I made these choices. But then Liz actually made a confession, which I think was just as important for our non-academic audience to hear. Um, her nonfiction Oxford University Press book had come out about 10 years before my novel. And since then, more information about Mary Bowser has been unearthed, some of it by me, the novelist, slash PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and Liz noted that this evidence had caused her to draw some different conclusions now than the ones she expressed in her book. Now, this idea that new evidence is still emerging about people who lived and things that happened hundreds or even thousands of years ago is not at all surprising to those of us who are actively engaged in researching the past. But to most people, history is over and done with. It's a bunch of facts to be forcibly memorized in school, then quickly forgotten. 
That is, they think that we academics speak about the past with a level of certainty that, in fact, we would consider to be the most egregious fakery of all. So ironically, it's my experience as a novelist comparing the interactions I have with audiences on college campuses or at academic conferences to the audiences with whom I speak beyond academia that's made me very keenly aware of how we perceive scholarship and history versus how it is perceived by the general public. So um, this spring, I've given talks about the history behind Juliet's nurse at the Turku Center for Medieval and Early Modern Studies in Finland and at the Shakespeare 450 conference in Paris. And I'm, of course, going to give this other one tomorrow that, again, I beg you to come see. Um, it's hard not to feel like I'm a fake when I'm among folks whose expertise in this particular period is much deeper than my own. But thus far, they, that is to say you, have welcomed me precisely because I embrace the role of a professional faker, exploring how scholars and other creative types intentionally fake it to come up with plausible and as accurate as possible understandings of the past. Thank you.